Okay, hi, uh, my name is Derek, um, and I'm in your instructor for the uh, operating systems class. Um, this is the final video in our series on memory management for what I call our Unit 4. Um, so this is actually material from Chapter 8, where we uh, go from uh, the basics of managing memory into talking about virtual memory, okay? So, um, so you know, th there's kind of a key breakthrough in the idea of virtual memory. So we're going to describe what that is um, um, and then look at the advantages that virtual memory gives you. Okay, so it's, it's, it's important to understand virtual memory because all modern operating systems that you're probably familiar with, you know, on your phone, um, on your desktop or laptop, so Windows or Linux or Mac OS or iPhone, iOS, are all using virtual memory, um, probably virtual memory with paging uh, as well, okay? So um, back to the, to talk about context, I've, I've looked at this uh, table from our textbook at, at the beginning of each one of these memory kind of slides. So just to kind of summarize about, we talked about paging and segmentation in the previous um, uh, video in the series. Um, so kind of the breakthrough idea on paging versus um, um, Fixed partitioning was the idea is we broke down the processes and our memory into fixed size chunks, pages that were much smaller than the size of the process, remember? Um, so this, this solves a lot of the problems about partitioning. Um, so yeah, in general for, for paging, there's no external fragmentation. Um, th there is some internal fragmentation just on the very last page of of the process that you break uh, up into pages, right? But, but usually this is trivial. Um, and likewise, we talked about segmentation last time. So you should remember to compare segmentation to dynamic partitioning. Uh, so here, uh, the idea is, is we break things down into unequal size chunks, but similar paging and segmentation are similar in this idea that, that in both cases, the, the chunks that we're breaking things down to are much smaller than the process size, or they can be, okay? So we'll break our processes up into lots of little pages or lots of little segments for a segmentation system, all right? So that brings us up to virtual memory. And, and like I said, all, all kind of modern um, memory management uses some sort of virtual memory system, all right? So um, a bit about the hardware and control structures for memory management. Um, so there are two characteristics fundamental to how memory management works um, up to this point as we've described it uh, using like paging and, and segmentation. So first of all, for either of those, all memory references are logical. Um, so when you compile the program, all the references get compiled down to logical references that are like a page number and an offset or a segment number and an offset. Okay, so, so the, the program gets broken up into, let's just talk about paging from now on, um, into logical pages, um, and the compiler creates everything in terms of a logical address space using page numbers and offsets, okay? And those are all, you know, all references then are dynamically translated at runtime um, from that logical address space to a physical address by the CPU. Okay, so there has to be some hardware support in the CPU to do that. So, I mean, at a minimum, you've got, uh, for a paging system, a register that holds the page table, and the operating system is responsible for updating that every time it wants to switch to a new process, making certain that the page table register points to the correct page table, okay? So, um, yeah, and, and a process will be broken up into a small number of pieces, either pages or segments, whichever we're talking about. Um, and these don't need to be contiguous, okay? So, you know, that was kind of a breakthrough in, in paging systems or segmentation systems that now once you break, break up your system and because you're using a logical address space that will correctly allow you to, you know, to... to to translate to your physical um, address wherever you uh, break the stuff up to, even if you break things apart and put them into different parts of memory, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, this is possible that you can put things into non-contiguous parts of memory because of this, you know, support for this dynamic translation. Um, 
uh, using a page table or a second table, okay? So, and then I probably didn't emph emphasize it a, a lot enough in the previous video, right? So that, that ability to break things up and to put them wherever you have avail mem available memory makes memory management much more flexible, okay? So paging and segmentation are big wins in terms of building um, much more useful computing systems, all right? So that brings us to, to virtual memory, okay? So the breakthrough idea of, of virtual memory is if those two characteristics are, are present, okay, all memory references are a logical address space translated at runtime, um, and a process is broken up into small pieces that don't need to be contiguously located, then um, that leads to this idea that it's not necessary that all of the pages slash segments of a process be in main memory during execution, okay? So at a minimum, the only thing that I need in memory is the page that holds the instruction and maybe the page that holds the data or the two pieces of data that I need to execute that next instruction. So I might only really need one, two, three pages um, to execute the next instruction, okay? So, and, and as long as I have those three pieces of information, I can execute the next instruction um, and continue on, right? So that's, that's, the, the, that, that's the breakthrough idea of, of virtual memory here, and, and, and that's important. Um, so, so but, but before we get back to why that's important or, or what advantages that has, so, so let's go through kind of how execution of a process using virtual memory works, all right? Um, so, so this is the idea of page faults. Sorry, it's kind of hidden a little bit back behind there. So, um, so basically, in a virtual memory paging system, so it's similar for segmentation, but I'll mostly concentrate on paging here. So if you're using virtual memory with paging, the operating system, when it first starts a new program, brings in just one or two pages of that program. So initially, maybe only the, the page with the first instruction that needs to be executed is brought in. Uh, and maybe that's it, right? Um, so the, the, the portion of the process that's in main memory in a virtual memory system is known as the resident set, okay? So since not all pages have to be in memory at any given point in time, the ones that are, that are physically in page frames, are, are referred to as the resident set, okay? So if, if you're executing code from um, a, a page that is loaded and it makes a reference to something that's not in main memory, um, so first of all, uh, as we'll see in the next slide, I mean, the, the uh, operating system, or the, actually the CPU will be able to tell that because when it looks it up in the page table, instead of a frame number, there's going to be some indication that that page isn't loaded yet. It's not resident, okay? So when that happens, when, when a reference is made to a page that's not currently in memory, um, the, the CPU, instead of, it, it can't um, finish that, memory reference to do the read or the write that was requested. So instead it generates an interrupt, okay? So an interrupt is generated when an address is needed that is not in main memory. Uh, that, that interrupt is known as a page fault, okay? So um, a, a reference to a page, you know, a reference to a logical page was made and we went to do the, the translation to find the physical page, but we found out that that page isn't loaded yet. It's, it's not in physical memory. So the, the CPU generates a page fault instead. Page fault is uh, generated when the CPU references a, a page that does not have a physical frame loaded in the page table yet, okay? So why is an interrupt generated? Because when that interrupt is generated, that allows the operating system to regain control. So instead of the, the process continuing to run, the, the operating system will um, intercept all page fault interrupts. And then the operating system will basically put that process into a block state. So it'll transition it to a block. So remember back to our chapter about processes and process states, right? So, so the, 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 pay, the process becomes blocked waiting on some I.O. So in this case, it's going to be blocked until we have a chance to load the, the, the page with the piece of data that was just referenced that caused the page fault, okay? 
So once it's loaded, you know, so, so we load that requested page from disk, uh, and once it's loaded, then the operating system uh, will unblock the process uh, and re return it back to a ready state so it can continue running, okay? Um, and uh, just to reiterate that process again a little bit quicker this time, so this happens for a page load. So execution of a process using virtual memory to, for a page load. So when a piece of a process that contains a uh, reference memory um, is, is, is eventually loaded into memory, um, so, so again, this, this all starts when we make a reference that, that causes a page fault, okay? So um, when that page fault occurs, the, the, you know, the CPU generates an interrupt, the operating system gets control, um, so then the operation, operating system will start the process of issuing a, a, a disk I.O. read request to load in the page that's missing into a physical frame. Um, and I already mentioned it blocks the process, puts it on into a block state and into a, like a blocked list, waiting on that page load event. Uh, this allows you know the operating system. So so now the operation isn't stuck like we talked about for multi-programming. So other programs can can run while this process is blocked, waiting on this page to load from virtual memory here. Um, so when the I/O completes, the operating system gets a different interrupt. Um, indicating uh, completion of I/O, um, and so it looks then, um, which tells us that the, the the page load was completed. So then it looks into the blocked list for looking for the process that was waiting on that page load and unblocks it. Um, and then you know you should be familiar with this part. So now at that point, the process goes back to a ready state, and it will eventually work its way back to the start of the ready queue. Now when it runs, so basically that address reference that it got interrupted on, the, the, the page fault occurred on, that address reference wasn't completed. So it didn't actually execute that instruction. So, so when the process gets selected to run again, that instruction will run from the beginning as if, and the reference will be made again. But this time when the, process, when the CPU goes to look up the, the, the page in the page table, it's been loaded now somewhere in memory. So now the, the reference can successfully be translated to a physical address and the process will continue um, you know, executing instructions from that point on, right? Um, okay, so back to this idea about the, break, the, the virtual memory breakthrough. So there's kind of two implications of loading the, the pages as needed rather than all at once. So when we talked about simple paging, we still had this assumption that when, when we started the process, we needed to load the whole process process into memory, right? It might not be contiguous, but it, every every bit of the process got loaded. So for virtual memory, not all of the process is in memory. And in fact, when we first started off, only maybe one or a handful of pages are initially loaded, okay? So, so that has implications, and both of these lead to improved system utilization. So virtual memory is a big win for utilization um, um, in, 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 uh, in, in these ways here. So first of all, you know, since only part of a process needs to be in memory, that means that we can have many, many more processes potentially in main memory at in any given time, okay? So, you know, we only load little bits of processes, only the bits that we currently need to execute the next few instructions. So why is that like a big important thing? So since we can have more processes, uh, with more processes loaded, we're more likely that some of them will be ready at any given time, okay? So this greatly increases the chance that we can increase CPU utilization, okay? So if we only have like two or three or a handful of processes for multiprogramming, it's much more likely that all of them are blocked right now waiting on something. But if we can have tens or hundreds or many, many processes, um, you know, it's likely that at least some of them at any given time can run right now. So the CPU can be kept much more busy in a virtual memory system. All right? Another one is that we're no longer constrained by the size of physical memory. Okay, So even for our virtual, uh, for our simple paging or simple segmentation systems, if we had to load the whole process into memory, even though it might be broken up, um, the, the biggest process was constrained by the physical size of memory. So that's no longer the case anymore. So in, in essence, 
uh, since we only need to have a little bit of the process in memory at a given time, we could potentially be running processes that are much bigger than our actual main memory, all right? Um, yeah, and kind of conversely, the number of processes that, that we can run for multiprogramming is only constrained by the smallest, so by the number of physical frames that we have, right? So uh, essentially, we could have just one page in every frame that we have in memory for a different process. So have up to that many processes running right now. Okay, so. All right, so those are all big wins for using virtual memory. Um, Okay, so, so let me talk a little bit about real and virtual memory, okay? So because the process executes only in main memory, um, that memory is referred to as real memory. Um, so really, th we're, this is just uh, some additional names for what we've already talked about. So, so real memory um, is really the physical memory or the absolute address that we defined before, okay? And virtual memory is basically the logical address space that we talked about for like paging. Um, and, and relative addressing schemes, okay? So the, the programmer, you know, doesn't perceive real memory. So when you're writing a program, or really it's more the compiler nowadays and things like that, or your interpreter, but um, so you perceive a virtual address space, so a logical virtual memory address space. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this this is the, the same idea as the logical address space that we defined before. It, it's really the same thing. So, so we're using logical address paging um, that we described in the previous video here. That's our logical address space. The only difference now, though, is that some of our logical pages, not all of our, our logical pages have to be uh, mapped to a frame, a physical frame at any given time. O only a subset, a resident set needs to be in memory to, to be executing the process, okay? So yeah, the space works exactly like we described for paging and page tables, but with the, with the possibility that a page reference, a page that's referenced might not be loaded yet. And then we have to have that hardware kind of support mechanism to generate a page fault um, so the operating system can load the needed page and continue the process on once we do have our page, so. Um, okay, so we've probably covered all these definitions, uh, um, so, so now you kind of know what virtual memory is, um, what a virtual address is, so a virtual address is another name for a logical address, but it's a logical address within a virtual memory um, addressing system, right? Our virtual address space is, is the same as our logical address space that we define for logical paging, all right? Um, in general, an address space is just the range of memory addresses available to a process, all right? So, um, this table is a good one to, to study, um, um, to, to, to make certain that you understand kind of all the conclusions that we make about uh, pay, simple paging versus virtual memory paging um, and simple segmentation versus virtual memory segmentation. So, so I, I really haven't discussed it, but, you know, um, you can use segmentation with virtual memory just the same way that you can use vir paging with virtual memory, but it's much more common to use virtual memory paging. Okay? So the only difference between virtual memory paging and simple paging is that um, not all pages. So they have the same advantages as simple paging, virtual memory paging does, with additional advantages. So it's actually a win-win to use virtual memory. You know? So not all pages need to be in memory. Um, so, so that does imply that we might have to stop and read a page in the main memory. Um, and that also means that uh, if memory is full, we might have to make a page replacement decision. So that's the topic of the other videos for the unit um, four here. So. Um, all right. So one final topic, though, before I, I end talking about virtual memory. So at one point... Um, it was not really known, uh, so it was thought that maybe virtual memory would be impractical. So, so people had this idea that, about virtual memory before they proved uh, that it would actually work. And, and the reason why there was some, some, um, some doubts about the possibility that it would work is because of this issue known as thrashing. Okay? So um, thrashing is basically the idea that um, if the operating system, so, so every time um, 
so, so let me just go through this. So the usual state for most modern uh, virtual memory systems is that pretty much the memory is completely filled up relatively quickly. So however much memory you have, you could always use more. Uh, and so an often, it's often the case that basically the steady state is that memory is full or, or almost completely full, full with many small processes, uh, piece, pieces of processes that are currently executing, okay? So that means that whenever a page fault occurs, um, we have to make a page replacement decision, right? So that means we're going to have to select one page to be thrown out so that we can load the, the needed page. So, so first we have to, to throw something out, write it back out to, to secondary storage so that we can load the needed page so that that process that called the page fault can continue on, okay? This is really the same issue with caching, okay? So, so, so you have the same uh, replacement decision uh, for caching when cache is full. The problem, and, and the, the same reason why it works for virtual memory is why it works for caching. We already discussed this, okay? So if, if you remember back to the first unit, chapter one and two. So the problem is that if you choose badly and you throw something out that, needs, that just needs to be used right away again, uh, it can lead to thrashing, which is the, basically that the, the operating system, or sorry, the computing system is spending all of its time loading and unloading data from secondary storage to, to cache or, or loading and unloading pages from secondary storage. Um, so, so for caching, it's spending all this time loading and unloading things from cache to secondary to, to primary memory. For virtual memory, it's, it's spending, thrashing is spending all this time loading and unloading things from secondary memory, which is disk, to primary memory, RAM, okay? So Whenever you have a page fault and you have to load a page, I mean, that's unuseful work, right? So you're not doing actual computation. You're doing overhead um, to load the data that you need to do your actual comp computation, right? So if, if you're spending all your time just loading and unloading stuff, um, you're not getting any real work done, right? So it was worried that, that virtual memory systems would be impractical and caching as well. Um, but in practice, because of the principle of locality, you know, we found out that, that, that virtual memory and caching uh, work. Uh, so in practice, they, the, the scheme can be made to work, okay? Um, so kind of uh, the principle of locality, a refresher. So this is back from our first unit um, in this course. So program and data references within a process tend to cluster. You shouldn't intuitively um, understand that if you've ever done any programming because you know that whenever you execute instructions, you're most likely going to in execute the next instruction after the current one you're executing. Or if you're processing data, you're most likely going to um, need to read or write the next data in, in an array or something after the one that you're currently reading. Right? So because most references are local, you know, or, or, or clustered together, um, only a few pieces of a process need to be in memory over a short period of time at a given time, okay? So again, that's back to what we call the working set or the resident set, okay? That, that set can drift, so, so later on I might be doing something different, a different part of my program, and I need a different resident set. But, but usually that, that resident set is a small percentage of the total pages or data that's, that's running. And once you have that resident set in, you can process for quite a bit of time before a page fault is going to happen. So, and again, that, that, that leads us to the conclusion, okay? Because of locality, it turns out that, that once I get a sufficient resident set, I will usually be able to, to, to process for quite a while before a page fault occurs. That means that I don't thrash. I, I could do more actual work than, than uh, having to do all my time with the overhead of loading and unloading things, all right? So kind of as a final thing, um, so, so, you know, um, you can run empirical experiments like this yourself pretty easily. Um, I think this is like a classical uh, uh, experiment from when people were trying to figure out whether virtual memory would work or not. Um, so this uh, so so this shows time going from left to right, and uh, on the y-axis is showing like references to pages. Okay, so again, at any subsection of time, let, let's say from like from here to to here. Like it's only like using the, the these particular pages where where you see kind 
update. And you notice that it shifts. So, so here, like from this time frame here to here, some something else happens. So we had to use a different residence set, right? Um, and, and it maybe looks a bit a more filled in than it really is. Um, but, um, but, but yeah, I mean, at, at, at any slice of time here, only like, you know, 20 or 30 percent of the total pages of memory are, are actually being used in the resonance set there. Um, okay, so that's it uh, for this video on virtual memory. Um, I hope that helps you make under, uh, understand the concept. Virtual memory is, is an important concept uh, to understand about computing systems. Um, and yep, yeah, that's it. And I will see you then in the next video.